Muslim community. So his views on education is another important view, he says, scholars should serve knowledge, not use knowledge to serve them. This is actually practically not something new. When Sister Farah mentioned about you know, my short bio, if you look at the medieval times, the great scholar of Muslims, when they wrote a book, even they did not mention their name on the book. After they passed away, those who published the book, they wrote, wrote their names on it. Many great, great scholars, they practice. Why? Because of not having showing off. They have kind of like, they were very sincere people. They were serving the knowledge. If you look at the Ihya Ulum al -Din, the revival of religious science, and Ghazali has a section about the teacher, parent, uh, teacher and student relations. You will see the important points there in terms of the education, in terms of the teacher and student relation. So that's why he says that the scholars should serve the knowledge, not using knowledge to serve them. And also, he, he has another notion, which is, again, new in the Islamic jurisprudence. Those who studied in Islamic jurisprudence, they know that there are uh, the definition of watan, or the concept of the country, are three. And uh, one of them is we call Watan al-Asli, which means the country of origin. If you are born in, in Singapore, so this is the country of your origin. And the second, they call Watan al-Sukna, the country you live, according to the Shafi school of thought, you know, more than 15 days, according to Hanafi school of thought, more than three days. It's Watan al-Sukna. And the last one is Watan al-Safari, the country you travel. You are a tourist. So Gulen offered that notion uh, Watan al Khizma, this world is Darul Khizma, which means is the house of serving. Also, you know, in, in some, uh, the definition of some jurists that they mentioned Darul Harb, Darul Islam, you know, the, and Gulen is proposing, you know, Darul Khizma. Whatever the Muslims are, it should be the country that you serve, the society, you serve the community. And also, one is another important point that the combination of science and morality is, is one of them is lacking, it will create problems. So what does it mean? The marriage of heart and mind, and he does not make any distinction between secular science and religious science. This is not something new actually. If you look at you know, Imam Ghazali's book, if you look at other scholars, in the, especially in the medieval times, a great Muslim scholars, they did not make any distinction between the religious science and secular science. If you look at Ivy Sena or Ibn Sena, he was a philosopher, he was a, uh, you know, uh, a good scholar, not very good, but he knows about the religion well, he was a, the best uh, doctor. And if you look at Abu Bakr al-Razi, same if you look at Ibn Khaldun, he was the history, father of the history according to Western scholars. On the other hand, he was a great judge and he was the great mufti in, in Egypt. For, for long term. So they gained both knowledges. So Gulen also says he does not make any distinction whether we call today in the West secular sciences, whether religious sciences. So for Gulen, this all sciences actually on one hand, it is, it is part of the religion. It's not something out of the religion, not against the religion. And, and the most important point which I'm going to discuss this one actually, role modeling. He says that 90, percent, nine zero percent of Islam is representation. Ten percent is conveying. If you look at the life of the Prophet, his longest khutbah is khutbah to Lada, his last sermon. If someone wants to read it, how long will it take? Five minutes, seven minutes. But if we look at how he represented Islam, and we see that how this is right. So 90% of Islam is to represent in all areas. And how that can be, it cannot happen by itself. It, it should happen to, re, to new renewal, you know, open to criticism, by the way. If you we, we look, if you pass the front of the madrasa of Imam Azam Abu Hanifa, you will see that there's a great debate going on between him and between his students. Criticism were going on. And even when it is tried to prove that there is, God doesn't exist in the mosque, he tried to
prove that God exists. You know, he used logic to prove that. And also, universal approach to education through the collective personality, we call it as shakhs al-ma'anawi, it is through the method of persuasion, not, not force. And he developed two important principles. Actually, when I say devil is not, is not something new, I would say that he renewed or he injected this. What is it? The, 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 the leadership. Because what we see in the Muslim society, in all societies, who wants to be leader? It, it's creating sometimes tension, sometimes problems. Even sometimes we see that clashes, violence. So he developed two important principles, which is based on, again, the Said Nursi. Uh, his work because he was influenced by Said Nursi. You know, modern scholars, they developed Islamic leadership into the servant leadership, the guardian leadership, by Jamal Badawi, by uh, Professor Bakun in, in the United States and Canada. Uh, but Gulen, he and Nursi developed actually the service in brotherhood. Uh, this is not something new. If I just say that when the Prophet وسلم, he was offering food to his companion, one of the Bedeyun came and asked him, who, who is the leader of this group? Uh, the Prophet could say, it's me, but he didn't, didn't say. He's used, Sayyidul Qawmi Khadimuhum. Who is the leader? Is the one who is serving. He wanted to teach a lesson to his companion. Number one, if you are a leader, you have to serve. Number two, he, it was a very polite answer. If, if, he, if he could say, me, for the prophets, even each sentence, it is unique and important. It should be the quality of the prophethood. He didn't say it's me. He said, Sayyid al-Qawmi Khadimah. So they developed a servant uh, service in brotherhood instead of leadership. So why, you know, they are successful? They opened schools in 130 countries. And some of these schools, you know, Islam is not being taught because the curriculum does not allow, the country does not allow. And however, these teachers, they, they, they represent Islam by, by the character, by adab. So if you look at, you know, the, the green area, which is, you know, respecting elders, love and country, being honest, helping those in need, taking care of family, some common values, which no one will say no. Whether they are Buddhist, whether they are Muslim, non-Muslim, agnostic, and everyone will accept that. So they focus on this area. On the other side, it's Islam. They practice their religion. Other side of that, that, you know, their religion. Lakum dinukum waliyadin. So they respect their religion. This is not, again, something that new, actually. When we look at the Quran, when there was a, a, an argument between a Jewish and a, uh, you know, Sayyidina Umar, I think it was pagan, astaghfirullah. Well, a pagan and Sayyidina Umar, they were kind of like a, something ugly that I, want, I don't want to talk, kind of like a swearing. And Allah revealed a verse that the Muslims should respect, you know, not swear to their other idols. Because when they do it, then in reverse, they will swear to God. Yusuf, another important Gulen is, again, is definition. Actually, on one hand, it's not new again. I would say renewal. I would say it is uh, renewal. It's about what this is. In the middle, the core definition of Islam, that the religion that stipulates how people should conduct their lives. Articles of faith, articles of the principles, and other issues. And the second meaning is that Islam refers to the action and attributes. It's an important definition, action and attributes. Sometimes we see that the action of non-Muslim, it is Islamic. The action of Muslim, it's non-Islamic. So we should applaud this action of all, all Islamic attributes, whether the Muslim has it or non-Muslim has it. I was giving a talk uh, at one of the universities in Australia, and someone asked me, you know, East and West, Islam and non-Muslims, kind of like uh, with, with that mentality. Then I, I asked him some question. I said that, do you think that in Australia everyone has health care? Is this un-Islamic? He said no. Then I asked him again, you know, the environment is un-Islamic? No. Then accountability of the leaders to the, to the society in certain level is un-Islamic? No. And 
you know, you have right of education is un-Islamic. Right of housing is un-Islamic. And then, no. So those who wake, want to make, you know, kind of like a clash between East and West and divide them, actually what we see today in the West and many Islamic principles are being practiced, applied, rather than in the Muslim-dominant countries. When I was born, the Turkish Prime Minister was Suleyman Demirel, and still he's in politics, 45, 48 years. So the third one is Shari'at Fatriya. You know, Shari'at Fatriya, which universe conducts itself. You know, if you look at whatever is going in the universe, whether some those who don't believe they would call Mother Nature is doing, but for the Muslims, Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala is doing. We call this. Shari'at Fatriya. And that Shari'at Fatriya is being conducted by everyone. Those who follow this, they will see the benefit of this. Those who don't follow, they will see, you know, the punishment of this even in this world. You know, there's a traffic law. You should speed 60 Ks or 70 Ks, not more than this. If you speed, then you, you, there's a most likely you will hit maybe a car or even kill someone. So the Shari'at Fatriya, again, we, saw, we see that the developed countries are following better than in some Muslim countries, or better than some Muslims. So in terms of collective personality, as I mentioned, Gulen mentioned a Shah Manavi, that we are a member of a spiritual, personal collectivity. And all teachers, even members of the movement, they are connected to each other spiritually not just form a, fill a form that you are the member of this, or, you know, please uh, take me off from the, from the list, I'm not your member. This is not something that has been applied uh, in, in that movement. Actually, uh, Gulen, he's not happy to be, movement, this, to be called as a Gulen movement. He never accepts that he's a leader, by the way. He says that I am one of you, just an ordinary person, one of whoever is helping, I'm just a, one of the volunteers among you. So he says that you use actually the khidma, khidma means service service to humanity. So he says that in terms of success, it's important to work, you know, personal, collective, as a teamwork. Even we see this in animal world. You can see, you know, that, that picture, how the bees are working as a team. In, and Said Nursi, he developed a theory, again, very interesting. He says that one plus one plus one, it will equal three. But when you bring these three one together, it will be 111. So if you are spiritually connected, work as a team, sacrifice your time, do voluntary, voluntarily, do your shura consultation, three people will be equivalent of 111. And or four people will be equivalent of 4,444. And we see that has been applied. Like, uh, it's, it's like, Franchise is like, you know, think globally, act, act locally. And when these three people really united in all issues, then they are successful. So in terms of character education, how that happens, because we see that majority of the parents are happy. There are some not happy parents as well. It's a triangle. How that triangle works, parents, teachers, and students. So what's the, what does it mean to parents? Parents just there, they bring their kids to the school and they go. This is not something that Gulen movement or his met applied. The parents should participate. Why? Because according to one of the uh, prominent in the economist, Albertini, he says that if the community is not actively engaged in education, in the schools, that school will not be successful. Go in the Islamic history, when the Islamic signs were flourishing, how the community was engaged in education, in building, you know, madrasas, in building what they call hammam or bathroom, in building karvan sarai, which means that, that is like the hotel today for free for everyone, building hospitals, building mosques. And the community was active, active participant of the educational institution. It was a duty. So that's why the, the parents play a very important role. 
as much as they can. For example, they are building a school. Maybe someone will do voluntarily be a bus driver. Someone will bring something that he pro you know, produce. So they should try to everyone to participate as much as they can. Whether financially, whether voluntarily, whether in education, whether in you know, uh, reaching out to the community. And this is very important in terms of to make the school, the school as an institution based on in the society, in the community. So for each class, there is a teacher, when I say a teacher, responsible for, con for, for the moral values. And also a mentor. A mentor should be at least a, a university student. Because a university student, it's easy to be friend of a high school student. You know, because of the age and because of the easy to build a friendship. So that's why there will be a mentor for each class. And that mentor, how, how it works, I'll just shortly explain. And the teachers and mentors, they are available 724, seven days a week, 24 hours a day, not between 8 a.m. till 4 p.m. The student can call at 11 o'clock, yes, 11 p.m., even, you know, early in the morning, you know, I, I haven't done my homework or this is my homework, can you help me on the phone? And they wouldn't say no. They wouldn't say why you don't you, you call me on this time. Because they are trained for this purpose. You know, when I ask one of the teachers, you know, why are you doing this? He said that, look, when I was young, someone from the movement gave me a hand, a hand and educate me in this way. You know, it's my time to repay to the community whether here, whether in other countries. Why? Because you, you can say that, why they are doing? I would say that, you know, some, as a Muslim, you can say for sake of Allah, in the Western society, you can say for the satisfaction, for the spiritual satisfaction, but it is working, seven, 24 hours. Is this something un-Islamic? No, sometimes we see that they would go and ask the Prophet in the, in the mid midnight questions. And the Prophet was not just, you know, no, a leader in a certain times. He was leader, he was serving the society 724. There was no schedule for him. That you know, you, c you shouldn't come at that time, you shouldn't ask me this question this time. My office hours are between you know, 9 a.m., 4 p.m. or so. Another is, you know, both teacher and mentor will visit the family. They will look at even the student's room, how it is, how he's studying, what, what's in hang on the wall. The, the cleanliness of the room. The, the, is room comfortable for, in terms of environment for study? And they will kind of like do consultation. Just imagine when you're a student, a secondary school or high school, your teacher and your mentor is coming to your home, having tea, coffee with your family, and talking to each other, then coming and seeing your room, ask, talking to you twice a year, three times a year. That has to be done. And that gives kind, kind of like a psychological comfort to the student to develop his ability. Also, to see them not as a teacher, as a role model. That they are second.